I met you first in 2015 when you were at an, a, 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 a business called MXC Capital. Is, is, is yeah, that wrong? That, that's correct. Yeah. I, yeah, we were running a uh, publicly quoted um, software investment firm that specialized. We took sort of large stakes in businesses and, and act, acted a bit like a PE firm, but on market without leverage. MXC, you were there for a number of years and, and yep. were founding members member of that business, is that correct? Yep, number of years and uh, a founding, albeit junior partner at the start and um, took more responsibility on the journey of, effectively that was my transition from becoming more of an advisor um, to mm -hmm. becoming more of an investor. So that was my first job out of um, you know, financial advisory into investing. And the and the short piece on the, the financial advisory was at city institutions in the nineties yep. and noughties. Are any uh, usual exactly. suspects? The uh, slightly uh, sort of hackneyed sort of chartered accountancy followed by twelve years investment banking, and then try and do something different. Okay, trying to get out. I suppose we, we, we've all been there. Um, so, or, or, and, or and just then... or just get another job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yes, uh, moving swiftly on. Um, and, and and so that journey took you to ADG Pref Cap, or was there a, a gap in between that? Um, you... no, 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 that's pretty much. Well, interestingly, so the, um, the journey was one of I became a bit disillusioned at trying to compete with mid market private equity firms uh, for assets in the space where prices to my mind had become unsustainably high for businesses that were carrying quite a lot of leverage and risk. Um, and so what I realized was that the ability for small software companies to build enterprise grade solutions and sell them um, was very different to where it was earlier in time researching because I'm not sort of deeply ingrained in the venture world um, and that's kind of where we came up with the idea for the product and the fund and it's taken us three years to get to this point where we've um, we've launched with external capital we've been doing it with our own money for, for a while um, and just to build slowly from there so it, it's kind of an evolution but that was always the plan when I left MXC was I wanted to build uh, somebody providing an alternative source of funding for earlier stage software companies. And, and in, if I was to draw the umbrella, it's ADG are the, the big sort of parent company that does lots of weird and wacky yep. investment stuff, which, you know, well, not weird and wacky, I think some public markets. Not we're a diversified, we're a diversified alternative asset management right. company, which is, you know, held by a, there's a few principal shareholders uh, that control the business and they've decided that they want to give us some backing to build a business um, in, in the venture space, which is, you know, so PrefCap is the kind of the products and the brand and mm. ADG is our home and our offices, which we sit in. Okay. And, and, and this was all formed in 18, 2019, when, when did you sort of start the, yeah. And, and I suppose really, if, if, you know, we, we do believe we have a fair amount of, of founders listening and obviously the key number one thing that most founders always uh, are kind of um, looking at or looking for is capital or investments. And, you know, I suppose how would they, in, in a way, how, what are the things you would be looking for for a founder who who kind of either approached you through your website, through your network, or um, or, or or through I suppose a mutual mutual contact? What what would they be? Um, well, look, people these days running money would tell you they'd probably quite like them to be diverse and not all the same. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we're pretty open-minded as as to as to as to, as to who we're going to meet, um, but generally we're looking for people that have a passion, um, some some level of track record of success within an organisation, either entrepreneurially or in larger business, 
um, and to have identified a niche that they really can make a difference in. So, you know, everything we do is B2B software. So that's a bit niche to start with. Um, and we're just looking for people that have um, identified an area where they can attract customers. So it's likely that founders will know how to attract customers. Um, it is probably it is probably one of the th key things that we look for. And how how you know if you were to look at the current environment, we're you know filming this in September, mid September. You know, generally we have the whole euphoria of people going back to work, and and you know, not just from the summer, but obviously this year from the whole COVID situation. Um, how is the current climate? Do you think for the, those companies coming to you? Do you think would you classify it's a flood of companies? It's a measured amount. It's in line or underweight with other periods. What, what what's your sort of litmus paper? Uh, my gut tells me that there are more companies um, and, the, and that the general standard of businesses we're seeing is better post pandemic. Um, I, I can't give you an absolute because we've been investing in trying to improve the way in which we go and find businesses. So I think that there's a few more businesses around, you know, if you said to me, have we seen more companies in the first six months of this year than last year? Yes, by a factor of a multiple. Um, but that's not all just the fact that the business, the, the world is flooded. Um, so you only need to go and look at the stats at sort of companies' house of just how many companies have been formed in the last three or four years yeah. uh, to see that, you know, we've got a big pipeline of opportunity coming at us. Um, however, within that, um, the I suspect that the challenges that founders face of making sure that they stand out, it, it becomes harder and, um, and and the metrics that investors are looking for will become slightly, probably a bit more ingrained. Um, would you, I, I would mean, you say that investors or, you know, your peers or, or maybe taking it from a, a pref cap perspective, you, your, your sort of your, bar, not your barriers, but your kind of your, your trigger points to actually invest now obviously more of these companies better quality are you raising the bar slightly because there is that sort of push more to the the top top right for you guys is that, is that um, a good way of looking at it i think that um look as a young investment business that's been doing it three years we've definitely ref refined some of our processes um so we might we might judge businesses slightly differently today than at the start um, mm -hmm. But we are making a very conscious effort not to simply look for larger businesses. I mean, look, the standard response to a glut of money and a glut of businesses is you pick the larger businesses. I mean, the two things that people are going for in venture are, you know, it's it's how quickly are you growing, and you know, do you you know how 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 much scale is there enough scale in the business today to get through the door, and then it's is there enough growth in the business to really excite the person you're selling to. Um, for us, it's actually slightly different in that we're often providing a, um, a, an additional round, an addition to an existing round or a bridging round. And we're generally actually looking for people that we think are on the precipice of um, an increase in the compounding of their growth. Um, mm -hmm. let's, let's face it, Chris, we see a lot of businesses. If you're, you know, if you're growing at more than 100% CAGR and you've got a couple of million of revenue, you don't need much help. <laughs> mm. um and so the real i think the, the differentiator and the skill um that i mean hopefully we have but everybody's looking for is that you're trying to pick these things as they're turning or just before um and, and backing founders that you think have made really good decisions in the months preceding your investment um that mean that you you will help to bear, bear the fruits afterwards so mm -hmm. um I, we are trying to make sure that we don't just start investing in larger businesses, which would be very easy to do, because I think that we believe we'd miss out on some great opportunities. Is there any kind of data or any kind of well, hot areas that you, you kind of say that you've really been drawn to, Mark? I think the flight to um, resilience is what we saw. Um, and that, that probably isn't matched across your audience of investors. You've got a lot of different types of investors, but you know we've really taken a lot of store from the people who had resilient uh, customers and didn't have a lot of churn. 
um, because that, you know, underpinned our belief that they're providing a service that um, hopefully is, you know, really important and valued. And if not, it's probably criminally too cheap, but at least no one's going to turn it off. <laughs> mm. Mm. That's interesting. Okay. And, and I suppose you, you, you know, would there be a traditional area if you if we were to look at your portfolio so far that, that is it is it more overweight fintech is it should fintech founders be reaching out to you is kind of what i'm saying yeah um we we've we've got a i think we've got a real blend of what we do so um we we like insure tech prop tech um we've got some fintech in there mm-hmm. um i think that within fintech we stick away from we try and try and avoid businesses that have too much consequential consumer recruitment drivers Mm -hmm. as part of their model. As in, there's an awful lot of B2B fintechs that need uh, to really engage with a huge number of consumers. We do like some of those businesses. Eyeball-based kind of uh, metric businesses will have a higher bar for us. Uh, But similarly also, we're only providing, you know, our check size, I think is probably, you know, we're more at the sort of seed and series A size of checks. So I think that we would naturally see sort of uh, the less less pure sort of some of those fintech plays. But yeah, I, th- I think that to be honest, we try to not rule anything out. We're just interested to uh, t- to learn a bit more about some of these some some of these subsectors because actually our typical is a business that is is pretty niche um, and therefore may may not be categorized i think interesting the the trend that we're seeing now though is as um as venture back businesses themselves become pretty big certainly obviously in the us and much larger growth entities the types of technology they buy is changing and there's a whole new um generation of, you know i think that um rev tech you know businesses around trying to build functionality to sit in front of and around your CRM, they're becoming really, really important. And the reason they're becoming really important is there's a ton of SaaS businesses out there now that need this stuff. And before the SaaS businesses ever existed, there wouldn't have been the opportunity to sell RevTech in that way. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing some, I think we're going to see some new categories and some new content sort of around that. Yeah. That's interesting. And, and and solely UK focused or do you, do you dip into Europe? We we do dip into Europe now. And um, interestingly, the first, uh, you know, first investment we've closed into our fund was a okay. uh, was a Dutch business. And actually really, you know, really smooth process. We use great advisors. Um, so I think certainly for us, um, Benelux and Germany are attractive spaces for us to go looking um, because there's there's some good opportunities at the, at the at the particular stage that we're going in yeah yeah it's quite interesting I'm, I'm sort of doing a bit of work on the sort of sentiment and the environment at the moment um you know, for a couple of publications and it's quite people are really trying to sort of understand that eu uk um sort of it's not trade war but Obviously, we all know that the UK has been the hiding part and the number one for many, many years across whichever size and series you're, you're talking about. But clearly, that's under some challenge now, as per, you know, just an example of what you've just said, that there is an ease of ability to um, to, to invest cross-border because of, you know, virtual Zoom. I mean, I imagine, did you meet the company that you invested in in? Holland. No, and that's an interesting part in that um, we've uh, we, we until two weeks ago we hadn't met the founders of the last three businesses we invested in. Wow, and and, and across UK and and Europe, I imagine, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So one of the so two UK businesses, but one of them they, they've got they've got customers in Australia and the US, and yeah. the chief exec was stuck in those places when. We were going through an investment process, yeah. um, and and another one who you know came to us through a you know trusted sort of intermediary advisor. We met them a ton of times on Zoom. They're, they weren't based particularly 
near to London all the time and they had no reason to be get traveling to an office at the point we made the investment. Yeah. Um, so, and as I say, yeah, and, and you know, very happy to invest in a Dutch business now digitally. I, I don't think, I, I don't think it, it's great to meet people in person and I think you can definitely get a lot more done and build stronger relationships, but it's not a must do for us. So do you, do you think, you know, as we trend line back more to post, or no, sorry, pre-COVID times, you, you, you're going to probably meet more companies before you invest in them, or do you just think it'll be case by case? I think we'll meet more, definitely. Mm. I think I think that's a preference, mm. um, but but it just wasn't, um, you know, if you wanted to get deals done over yeah. the last sort of year, you needed to be pragmatic about it. And I know that there were some investors that were forcing people to travel and meet them, but um really we tend not to take a board seat yeah um a, a, a slightly sort of uh lower touch mm -hmm. um relationship with our founders um yeah. I, I, and interesting i think i think it, where our model probably works really well is to catch up a few times here in person after the investment yeah no that's that's a good point and then i was interested by your comments about you you've invested quite a bit in the process of, of how you are finding uh, companies? Is that, is that, have you rolled out some technology? Are you using more um, pro programs or, or platforms? Or is it, is it a people thing? What's going on there, Mark? I think it's really people. We strengthen our team. Uh, Jesse, who I think you've met, joined us uh, from, from Accenture. And, um, and so I just think we've really just stepped our game up. Um, Interestingly, I thought that we were going to be going down more of a uh, sort of data-driven, trawling Bohurst and um, all of the um, databases, because obviously for UK businesses anyway, you know, UK business can't raise money without it going to companies' house. Mm -hmm. The challenge, of course, of that is that uh, far after the event, that for us, it's, it's not timely enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, interestingly, there are a number of uh, funds that, are just simply got, you know, they've got some people doing that and just ringing the companies. Um, but, but I think that probably almost creates too many um, opportunities. So what we've actually realized though, is that the, the space that you operate in actually in of providing advice to businesses that are seeking funding, um, that's a lot more disintermediated than, than I'd realized. And there's just an awful lot more people out there um, um, giving advice on a formal or an informal basis. Um, and so what we've kind of done is we've made it our jobs to get around those guys and just say, look, put pref cap in your kit bag. We're not all things to all people. We can provide, you know, our sweet spot is providing up to a million pounds of growth capital on top of an existing round or between rounds. Yeah. You know, that, that doesn't tick all the boxes, but we don't also have a huge amount of direct competitors. Um, we're starting to see also a bit more um, interaction from some um, some funds as well who who are more likely now probably I think to collaborate with us. Okay, that's that's interesting. So um, I'll, I'll pick up on the funds in a minute, but I was going to ask actually on the you know my inbox is starting to get uh, not like you know bombarded by invites for in person events, but. Um, I actually thought there'd probably be more, um, so I'm a bit surprised. Um, but, but I'm still getting quite a few, um, you know, like, like webinar stroke. Um, this, you know, our accelerator cohort is ending their, you know, six month, uh, you know, um, you know, virtual session, you know, campaign or whatever. And yeah, I just wondered where you know you sit are you seeing an upshift in people you, you know you sat there in i think in the city of london are there going to yeah. be more events are you getting more invites to uh, physical things or, or is it pretty I hope so yeah. i think i think that we were seeing a few more um i think the um i think we've had a real a combination of um i think covid case rates in the southeast rising in july combined with school holidays created yeah. a natural hiatus that meant you can't really plot a line through it. Yeah. Um, I thought that would have affected your and my availability, at least, Chris, if, yeah. and so, for things. So, so we did a few things before. 
and also people were getting a little bit nervous about sort of you know raising raising rates and and so Mm. i think well let's see what happens i think it's a bit of a watch and see but what i did notice is that when people could go to in-person events they did and i suspect that um the outcomes would have been better they certainly were for us yeah So we are directly engaged with a company that may or may not accept our investment, but we have made an offer to that we met at a Mixer event um, Mm. just at the start of the summer. That was a company we'd already been introduced to. We'd already done a couple of video calls, but not until I was able to sit with the and stand with the founders for a couple of hours and, Mm. and have a sort of a sort of slightly broader, less focused discussion. Yeah. I think that really helped build a relationship. Yeah. The chemistry. And then, um, you, as a, as you mentioned, the 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 funds that you're working with, there are maybe more funds. Are they UK? Are they US? Are they what's the flavour there, Mark? Well, I think the flavour. Look, um, every business we meet, I guess, will have some investors normally. So we're never the first money in. Yeah. And, and some of those investors will be funds that are well known to you and I, and some will be others that weren't yeah. so well known. And we're just sort of repeatedly saying, look, this is what we provide. It can be useful. We can work around an existing, um, you know, lead lead at the seed rate uh, level. Um, and so we're getting just a bit more two way conversation. And in, in your sort of conversations with founders, are you finding that? you could be up against new competition or other people doing what you're, yeah, you're, you're doing? That, is, is that a trend? So, yes. Um, we always expected more people to provide sort of, sort of the hybrid of venture debt equity that we provide. Um, I was speaking to someone the other day that does something very similar in Germany. I'd never heard of the fund. You know, they were an existing investor in a business we're talking to to find out whether our capital would be com- you know, compatible with theirs. And it turns out they're doing something to some respects quite similar to us. Mm. Um, So yes, yes, we are. um, But probably the most, you know, the most relevant competition we would usually face is from the existing investors choosing to um, invest again, rather than let someone new into the club. You know, there's, you're an expert in in this arena, but there's no hard and fast way of getting to a great series a um but founders will always be mindful of what the capital structure is going to look like and trying to make sure that whatever they do is it's going to look good to the next investor we're involved in that process Mm, yeah Um, but we all often make offers to businesses where the existing investors might choose to match or improve those terms as as is as is their prerogative and right um, yeah. and we take no offence from that at all. So that's our. Well, our and, some, and sometimes I imagine, Mark, you're the actual stimulus for them to do it. Uh, o- often, actually, usually. And yeah. one thing we'll always say to founders, we'll say is, look, we don't get that precious about um, our time if people are respectful of it. So we're very happy to look into seeing what we can provide to a business now. And then if that's an attractive thing to take to their investors, and if their investors don't like it, um, it, can, it is often, as you say, the stimulus for a conversation with those investors about putting a further round of funding in to give the business the growth um, firepower it needs. Yeah. And I suppose going back to the point about the other businesses um, similar to, to yourselves, and you mentioned the one in Germany, do, do you think, you know, as, as a business and how you look at the next three to five years, would you think there could be consolidation you might want to work more closely with some of these different you know maybe some of them become international partners or is that is that not really the way you want to shape well, things i don't think that's necessarily what we're thinking of today but if you're talking about i guess for your audience is there going to be a broader range of funding options for growth founders yes mm-hmm. that's a good thing the fact that there's money chasing down from you know, larger uh, company environment into venture is, is good for founders. Yeah. How- that eventually we will get to a sort of point where people have to do smaller checks and, and smaller, smaller sizes and, and things should he maybe come back? Because I think it's very clear to, to 
lots of people we talk to both funds and, and founders yeah that it, it's it's extremely tough out there at the moment for for that that space so i mean crystal ball in hand um you think this, it, it could become better next year or are we talking a longer time period because clearly oh. we're, we're stuck in we're entrenched in a, a, a big sort of series a and pre-series a piece at the moment i think as i as we talk to people and it's i just wonder when it's going to defrost so to speak i i think it may do um but i think it's going to come down to um congestion of investing and um and the runways and lives of those funds that you're talking about um i, I haven't done a detailed analysis of you know how long some of those investing periods are left to go but invariably if you if we look at private equity um as a, as a sort of more mature um industry that we can take lessons from um typically as funds get towards the end of the investing period um human nature might leave the um the, the sort of behavior around what they're choosing to do to change a bit and and what we're not talking about funds doing is making bad investments because obviously there's a because there's a lot more companies around there's a lot of opportunity to do that but i think it's about having the flexibility to maybe break a couple of rules here and there um or, or, or just look at some slightly smaller business that's what i think those guys will end up doing <clears throat> which might lead to um a slightly freer environment i think it's we're also in the uk we're incredibly affected by what the EIS appetite might or might not be. Mm -hmm. and, and interestingly, I think the bigger dynamic at play is whether EIS funds keep getting bigger and bigger or whether there's more angel rooms and those kinds of um, environments because um, I, th th there's an awful lot of play there in terms of, but let's face it, EIS is pretty much the only attractive tax break left in the, for for, mm. for people. Um, and, and crikey, let's hope that remains because without that, um, it would be really tough for small businesses. Yeah, so any looking at the, the government's perspective, any anything they should, you think that, sorry, say it again, anything you think they should do to make this a lot easier for um for for growth because obviously we we had the great years of growth with cameron and seis and eis in 09 10 11 it became a you know a, 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 a momentum play and we've had well, I spent I, 10 I, years I, I'm, of... I, I'm i sort of see it both sides the tightening of eis rules is it made things better for technology businesses so knowledge intensive software companies still have it pretty good what what they closed down was investing in things that weren't innovative and adding to the you know to growth so um i i i'm not an expert in these areas but any anything that made it easier to flow the eis money i'm not sure that the tax break itself necessarily needs to be any bigger i just think that maybe the the the, the sort of the the inertia around it could be reduced um, or, 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 or actually maybe more actively pushed um, to a wider selection of mass affluent people who wouldn't, you know, you spent a number of years working in financial markets, you know, the UK um, stock, stock markets are very different to the US because we just don't have retail investors. You mm. know, in the UK, people give their money to their pension fund, pension fund manager invests it. Whereas in the US, it, you know, people have stockbrokers. And so I think mm. it, with people getting more interested in their um, personal finances, I think that there could be some great opportunities to, you know, if you could make a, if you could make an EIS investment via a Revolut, that that would be a game changer. Yeah. And, and, and I wouldn't be surprised that Nikolai and Revolut will, will probably try and try and introduce that. Yeah. It's going to also come down to performance. So we work with a number of angels. Um, I'm sure you do. I think there's a lot of people out there made EIS investments in the last five years that need to see some sold. 
Yeah, I mean, well, not not just five years. I think ten years, isn't it? It's kind of we're at that point in the cycle. Like I was saying, you know, the big growth was oh nine to to twelve, and then people got into it then, and they've done ten years. They look back over COVID times and they're like, oh, late fifties or sixties, which is generally the age of a typical, you know, EIS investing person. Um, I don't know, which, again, going back to, again, the, the point we made about Revolut, you know, if you get a whole bunch of companies like Revolut um, IPOing and they are making a whole wave of new um, potential angel in that could be the next start of the cycle. I don't, I, I don't know. Well, no, I think the, the good thing to sort of put to you there, though, is that the one thing I am seeing as an absolute trend is that US VC backed businesses are buying UK software companies? Yeah, and yeah. and 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 it, okay, we're not necessarily creating as many unicorns as maybe we should, or maybe we're not selling things for as quite as high a valuation as we might like, but that will put money back into that into the into into that pot, yeah. um, and 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 I think that that's the natural sort of order of things and. And I think people that make EIS investments broadly, they would love the idea of investing sort of for four or five years and then maybe the company being sold. I think that I think mm. the, the view that all of those types of investors want to own something for 10 years um, and see it dominate a category, I think that's that's probably more the professional investors. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Anthony, any any questions from you? Because I'm both just coming up to our uh, at uh, the end of our hour. No, it's okay. The the internet is really variable. Oh, so okay, all right. You're you're struggling today. You you've had Monday blues, obviously. Um, <laughs> so uh, so back to a Friday in future. Um, but Mark, look, uh, it's been good good to catch up. Thank you for all your insights. One thing we always love to uh, to delve into, and I know you've got a, a, a young small family, so free time is probably at a minimum. But um, as per it was the Emmys last night, there is a lot of chatter about all the great content that's suddenly about to hit our screens again. Um, anything of note that you've you've gorged on over the uh, summer months on Netflix or Amazon Prime that, that you'd recommend to our audience? Um, I, I wish there was something incredibly a highbrow, but I, I did find myself watching um, something called Below Deck, which has been around for ages, which is incredibly trashy. Um, but that, that, I'll be honest, that, that sort of, that filled sort of the uh, the, the, the void of, of that kind of sort of entertainment. That was quite entertaining, but no. Um, we read, read a few good books. Louis, Louis okay. Theroux's book, that's what I'd say. Uh, Got to get through this is brilliant. That's very good. Louis Theroux, what's the title? Uh, I think it's Got to get through this. Got to get through this. And is it about? covid no it's it's about it's it's basically um he couldn't make any documentaries at the end he did quite a good podcast i mean he, did, he couldn't make yeah. any documentaries at the end of uh you know during the covid period so he wrote a reflective book on his experiences broadly in america making those kind of slightly sort of wacky ones yeah. um, and yeah. he, he he writes incredibly well yeah yeah he's a clever man i love his podcast actually um, but no, that's great. Great suggestion. So thank you, mate. And look forward to hopefully seeing you at maybe one of our events in the in the uh, autumn. So we're, we're currently talking to a few people about um, uh, maybe one in uh, happening in November, early November. So I will be in touch. But well, thank, thank you for your time and regards to the rest of the team and have a great week.